On this day in 1892, Celtic won the Scottish Cup for the first time, ensuring theirs would be the last name inscribed on the trophy. Like Celtic's first appearance on this stage, the 1892 Scottish Cup final required a second match after the first was declared a friendly. When Celtic and Queen's Park met for the first attempt at Ibrox on the 12th of March 1892, such was the excitement generated by the tie, a 40,000 crowd crammed into a dangerously overcrowded enclosure. And with fans encroaching onto the pitch two hours before the scheduled four o'clock kickoff, both teams protested and the match was declared a friendly by half-time. Celtic emerged as 1-0 winners, the goal scored by Johnny Campbell. Both teams had to make changes for the replay on the 9th of April 1892, with Johnny Madden injured and replaced by Peter Dowds, while Queen's Park were without their captain, Bob Smelly, who was ill, and halfback John Gillespie, who would later make a single guest appearance for Celtic in a match billed as being for the Championship of Great Britain against Aston Villa in 1896. Before the match began, Queen's Park also lost the services of fullback Walter Arnott, so their team had a slightly makeshift look about it, with the player listed on the day as H. Scott, actually an ex-player, no longer on their books, but roped in to make up the numbers. The admission price was doubled to a shilling from the first match, and this had the desired effect, as this time only around 25,000 were present to see Celtic line up. Cullen, Reynolds, Doyle, Mealy, Kelly, Gallagher, McCallum, Brady, Dowds, McMahon, Campbell. Queen's Park won the toss and elected to play with the strong wind in the first half. They dominated the first 45 minutes, although Celtic almost took the lead. The Scotsman of the 11th of April 1892 reporting, On one occasion early in the game, however, the Celtic were very near scoring a beautiful shot which just went over the bar being sent in by W. Mealy. The Celtic defence was hard pressed, with Jerry Reynolds, Dan Doyle and James Kelly outstanding, but Queen's Park made the breakthrough after 20 minutes. The Scotsman reported, With the game about 20 minutes old, the Queen's made a determined raid on the Celtic goal and their efforts were this time rewarded, Waddle putting through the first goal of the match amid an enthusiastic outburst of cheering from the many Queen supporters on the ground. This gave the Queen's Park the confidence which it was felt by their supporters they required and for a considerable time they hemmed the Celtic in on their own goal line, corner after corner being conceded to them. The second half saw a complete turnaround as Celtic now had the advantage of the win behind them and the left-wing partnership of Sandy McMahon and Johnny Campbell turned the tide in their favour. It's not clear which of this magnificent pair scored the equaliser. The Scotsman of the 11th of April reported, For a time, the Queen's continued to show a little of the form of the first half, but this soon died away by reason of the strong attack which the Celts were now making. The Irish men's efforts were at length rewarded as, after some smart play in front of the goal, McMahon, with a wonderful overhead shot, put through the first goal for his team. This was received with an extraordinary outburst of enthusiasm from the Parkhead Club's followers and was really the turning point of the game, as further improvement was noticeable in the play of the Irishmen from this point. The Glasgow Herald, on the other hand, in a more succinct description, wrote, Five minutes had gone, and a tremendous cheer announced that Campbell had scored for the Celtic, who were now on a level footing. Only a few minutes later, Celtic took the lead, and again Campbell and McMahon were instrumental, the Glasgow Herald writing, The game opened up considerably, and the Celts, with the wind, were showing to some advantage, playing better all round. They were certainly receiving plenty of encouragement, and from some really tricky and neat passing in front of goal, Campbell shot the second goal, Baird having no chance to save. It was all Celtic now, with the Glasgow Herald writing, The Celts were fairly in the mood, dribbling and passing beautifully, while the defence was exceedingly steady. Sandy McMahon scored either his first or second to put Celtic 3-1 ahead. The Glasgow Herald recording, The Celtic were again to the other end, and after Baird had saved splendidly, McMahon rushed through the third goal for the Celts amidst great cheering and shaking of hands. The Scotsman gives a better impression of the reaction. 
The Celtic followers were now quite beside themselves with delight, and all the members of the team came in for favourable comment. Captain James Kelly, subject of some criticism following Scotland's defeat to England the week before, had a hand in Celtic's fourth goal, his free kick deflecting off a defender and past the keeper. In the closing moments, Sandy McMahon sealed the win with what had long become a trademark header from a corner kick. If the Scotsman report is correct, this was the first Scottish Cup final hat-trick by a Celtic player. But none of the newspaper reports make special mention of this, so Campbell and McMahon might well have scored a brace each. In this era, trophies were not presented to captains on the field in front of the fans at the end of the match. Celtic President John Glass accepted the cup at a reception in Glasgow's Alexandra Hotel later that evening. As it was handed over, Celtic's name had been engraved on what is now the oldest trophy in world football, Celtic Football Club 1891-92. They joined the other names on the trophy, Queen's Park, Vale of Leven, Dumbarton, Renton, Hibernians, Third Lanark, Heart of Midlothian. After this, the 19th final, there was no more room on the trophy itself for the names of the winner. Since then, they have all been engraved on plaques on the base of the trophy. It's difficult for us in the early 21st century to comprehend the magnitude of Celtic's first Scottish Cup win. The Scottish League was only in its second season and the Cup was by far the more prestigious competition. With little in the way of organised football outside of Britain and the north of Ireland, the Scottish Cup was second in prestige in the football world only to the FA Cup, which Scottish clubs no longer competed for. This, for the first generation of Celtic supporters, was their Lisbon moment. The Scottish referee of the 11th of April 1892 wrote of the celebrations in the east end of Glasgow. Even the women lent a hand and helped in no small measure to make the rejoicings hearty. But it was when the boys came marching home again from the aristocratic Ibrooks that the fun began in earnest. And as the evening wore on, the holy stand put on an air of alleged gaiety and a colour of a deep carnation that would have given an unenlightened stranger the severe knock of astonishment. Bands! You ought to have seen them! They perambulated all the district until well on in the evening and with the aid of a liberal use of party music helped to make things hum along merrily. Of course, this caused a risk of eruption with Billy's men, but what of that? Hadn't the Celts beat the mighty Queen's Park and for the first time won the Scottish Cup? Truly the East End was a perfect turmoil until the very early hours of the Sunday, and many of the crowd won't be able to get over the rejoicing racket for days to come.